to Coffee and Prayer. I'm Pastor Andrew F. Carter, and it is 5.30 a.m. here in Inglewood, California. As you guys are tuning in, please let me know where it is that you are and uh, what time it is. And we got people from Seattle, right? The great Northwest, home of Starbucks, right? I already know out the gate. It's like being a Christian, you've got to be careful with every, what you say these days. I've already got jokes. Uh, I'm, I'm in a silly, goofy mood. I'm going to tell you all right now. I already know somebody's like, Starbucks is uh, it's demonic and it's evil and we don't frequent that establishment. It's like, calm down. All I know is that Starbucks originated in, in Seattle. Uh, it's not that I go there or even support the establishment. Uh, I just know how, how we get. We get so religious. It's like we'll have an Apple iPhone watching Instagram, but we'll curse Starbucks and be like, Starbucks uses the marine spirit as their logo, but they're completely on an iPhone with an apple with a bite taken out of it that symbolizes the great fall of humanity, where we pick and choose. I love how we pick and choose what we support. I'll never support that establishment, but you've got Egyptian cotton on your bed sheets, and the Egyptians held the Hebrews in captivity. It's like, oh my Lord, we are such a weird little creation and the way we act it's so funny anyway i don't even got star i got uh what is this this is don juan julio or something like that don julio or is that a tequila oh wow no i don't have tequila in my cup it's uh it's this hawaiian hazelnut coffee pod you guys it's uh it's good stuff did i say don julio or don juan i don't know the difference not because i'm a drunk it's because <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's going to be one of those days. I already feel it. Italy's in the house. Uh, we got the Philippines, Costa Mesa. We got brothers and sisters from Antigua, Arizona, Connecticut. Do you say Connecticut or Connecticut? Connecticut, Connecticut. I don't know. Hey, but check it out. Let's pray. We've got some fun stuff. No, uh, it's not Don Julio. It's Don Juan. Or is that even it? Ah, I'm over it. I want to share this morning. Man, it's crazy because we're talking about in Genesis chapter 40. Hey, if somebody could put that in the chat, that would be awesome. Our our devotions for the day. I know Sister May's camping. She might not have put those in there. She might not be here today. So it's 1 John chapter 3. That's our scripture. That's our our, our Bible. And then it's uh, Genesis chapter 40. If someone would put that in the chat so I can pin it, um, because people are going to come in and they're going to be like, where are we at? What scripture are we reading? And I'm like, this guy's not even reading scripture. But if you wanted to, it's pinned at the bottom. I'm like, well, why isn't he reading scripture? I don't know. Because the guy is, uh, he's hopped up on coffee and he's losing his mind. But God is good. I, w- I want to share with you guys. Oh, Sister May's right there, man. I must have missed it. Bam. Even while camping. You see that? I love it. I love it. I love it. So, uh, we're talking about in chapter 40 about dreams, right? Joseph, the dreamer. We're talking about him. Uh, the, the, the Pharaoh's baker and butler find themselves incarcerated and underneath the watch of Joseph and Joseph, uh, interprets their dreams. Now, um, we're not going to jump into that quite yet, but I wanted to share. I had a dream. I woke up at about four, about four o'clock is what it was. And I was having this dream and it was a very intricate dream of bricks being laid and mortar being applied between the bricks. And all I saw was a set of hands and the bricks were being handled so delicately. They, they were being placed meticulously and making sure that they were tight and firm and they were snug together. And then the mortar was being applied ever so gently, but in a manner that wasn't sloppy. It wasn't rushed. It wasn't quick. And all I was seeing in this dream was brick by brick, gently and delicately and intricately and meticulously, right, uh, being placed together. And, and it was this picture of perfection. And as I was watching this, it was like watching one of those TikTok videos. I know some of you guys, like some, some of you guys, like my wife, like to watch those videos that are people go, oh, that's satisfying to watch. They'll, they'll see something being cut really smooth and they'll, they'll, it's like ASMR. There's like the sound and people will watch and it's just this, it's this perfect visual of things being done in a a uniform manner. And this is what I was witnessing in this dream. It was just hands and it was this bricks and it was set, set, set. 
And I, I, I felt God jar me out of my sleep. I don't wake up like that usually. And I woke up and I was just like, okay, Lord, what, what was this about? I, I'm praying because I'm like, first off, I'm like, Lord, let me go back to sleep. I got 30 more minutes. I had a basketball game last night. Like, let me get that 30. But before I could, I had to open my notes and he was speaking very clearly to me. And the words that he spoke was nothing made in haste stands the test of time. That was the words that I wrote in my notes. Nothing made in haste stands the test of time. The message was this, is that God is laying a firm foundation for you. You guys understand that? A firm foundation. And the firm foundation that he is laying is being laid brick by brick. It's being laid meticulously. There is not a thing that is out of place. God has you right where he wants you. And my, maybe you're not where you want to be because God is laying a firm foundation. He is establishing something for you to stand on brick by brick. And you can apply this to your job. You can apply this to your relationship. You can apply this to your finances. You can apply this to your family. You can apply this to your fitness. You can apply this to every aspect of your life. God is establishing a firm foundation, but he will not be rushed. He will not submit to your timetable. He will not give in to your haste because he understands that nothing built in haste, right, done quickly will stand the test of time. And I wrote that down. And then as I was going back to sleep, he gave me this example. And he goes, Andrew, you worked in a manufactured home building site for four years. Uh, I worked building manufactured homes. And I remember that we could bust out 10 floors, right? If it was a double wide, that's five homes in a day. You, we typically would, we would shoot for about 10 floors a day in our busy season, 10 floors. And if it was a double wide, that's about five homes. If it was a triple wide, that's about three. And we would start a partial for the next day. But it was, we, we did floors. That's how we would, would, you know, basically establish our day. The average is about 10 floors a day. So in any average day, we could build anywhere from, I don't know, three to five full homes from start to finish, from the chassis on which it was built until the final and finished touches where it's got cabinets, it's plumbed, electricity, and everything. So he started thinking, think about how quick you would build these manufactured homes. And we would churn these things out quickly. And then he says, okay, now think about site-built homes, homes that are built on site. How how long does it typically take to build a site built home from start to finish? I, I can simply tell you that with the same amount of men and manpower, you're not churning out three to five site built homes in a day, right? So so I'm not here to knock manufactured homes or even to talk about how they hold or don't hold their value or what's a good or not a good investment, but the for the very simple fact that there's so many hands and there's this sense of urgency and rush that is happening, manufactured homes, uh, they will deteriorate, they will fall apart, and uh, they won't hold their value as well as something that is site-built. Right? And, and I'm not here to debate, I watched it. I would see people cut corners. It, it was a job, man, it was a nine to five. So the manufactured homes, they were getting skimpy on glue if they ran out of materials. They're finding ways to cut corners to make sure that, you know, they're, they're trying to slap drywall on everything so OSHA can't come in and inspect to make sure that we've got the right spacing between studs. It was an absolute nightmare. Uh, being behind the scenes of building them, I've noticed that because things were done in haste, they will not stand the test of time. Many manufactured homes, at least as far as I saw and witnessed in my personal experience, they wouldn't even hold shape being transported to where they were. You had to send a, site, a team out with the actual manufactured home because when you went to place it on its foundation, you had to go through and fix it and fix the drywall where things shifted and adjusted because it's not the same quality as something that was built on site. So, so I share all of that to share this with you. God is laying a firm foundation and it is intricate. It is meticulous, right? It is, it, it is something that takes time and it's done that way so that it can stand the test of time. So don't be rushed. Don't fall into this mind trap or this, this pit of, of rushing through life or trying to run ahead of God because what he's doing is establishing you for the long term. Amen. Man, that's wild. I 
honestly don't typically, Holy Spirit is heavy. I don't usually have dreams. I've, I've talked about this. I'm not a big dream guy and uh, I'm not a big explanation guy. But uh, God not only gave me a dream last night, but he also gave me an interpretation. And uh, that is a newer gift that I had a dream a couple weeks ago. That is a newer gift that God, that I'm stepping into. Most of the time, I'm dreaming about whatever it is that I did. So I played ball last night. 99% of the time, I would probably dream about playing basketball. But God has been giving me uh, these dreams and these interpretations to match uh, on a more regular basis. This is, a, a, I believe, a divine gifting, a supernatural gifting that he is imparting to me. And as I'm drawing closer to him and being more submitted and obedient, he's opening and unveiling some of these gifts. And I believe he wants to do the same in your guys' lives. So let's pray and let's get into the scripture. I pray that that speaks to somebody out there. Maybe that eases your mind or gives you a little bit of comfort. I know that it did for me because I find myself uh, getting excited about the future. Uh, and, and because I'm excited about the future and what God is doing in my tomorrows, I, I start to try to fast forward through my todays, but there's a lot that needs to be done in my todays. Todays essentially are the bricks that are being laid meticulously. So what I do today directly affects my tomorrow. So if I'm not present here and taking care of what I have been given to steward over, I'm going to end up losing it because I'm so focused on my tomorrows. Ooh, these are words, man. I hope you guys are writing these down. Come on, somebody. So, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today. Uh, we are just honored to be here, to be in this place. We pray that your word would be written on our innermost being. We are so honored and privileged to know you. And we don't take this lightly. We're not just, uh, we're just not getting familiar or stuck in a rut or a routine. God, we are here for a fresh anointing. We are here to, for, to start a brand new day. Uh, we are here and present in this moment. We set aside distractions. We set aside things that are pulling at our focus and our attention. God, we want more of you. Lord, we want all of you and, and none of us. Uh, we want it to all be about you. It is about you, Lord. You are the main character. You are the star of the show. We are very small pieces of a much greater puzzle. Lord, help us to stay in our lane. Help us to play our part and help us to have a deeper, better understanding of who you are and what it is that you want to use us for because we, Lord, are yours. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So check this out. Uh, right in First John chapter 3, it starts with this. It says, the Father has loved us so much that we are called children of God. You guys, please highlight that, underline that, remember. Uh, many times I talk about that we, uh, we have the privilege of serving God. But I always say that he says we're no longer servants, we're friends. We're no longer servants, we're friends. We're children of God. He loves us. We are his. But it goes on further to say, and, and we'll get to this part, but because he loves us and because he laid his life down, it is our privilege to live a life for him, to essentially serve him because we love him and not out of obligation, not out of, not because that's what saves us. It's because we are honored and privileged. And it's like, wow, you loved me through all of my sin. You loved me through all of the darkness. You loved me despite knowing that I would turn my back on you, that my heart was filled with evil, that I was a liar and a cheater and a manipulator. And despite all of the, the sin that I lived in, you still paid the price for all of that. You covered the debt. You covered You covered it all. That's how much you loved me. Oh, you call me friend. I'm your child. But because of that, I want to live a life that honors you because of that love, right? Because of that love. And it says that, and we are really his children. The reason the people in the world do not know us is that they have not known him. We are not recognized or identified as children of God. In fact, many of us are, uh, we're, we're recognized as um, stupid. We're recognized as ignorant, uh, as naive, that we still believe in fairy tales. We still believe in a sky daddy, uh, that we're clowns. Um, we're less intelligent. We're less educated. Uh, the, the things and the, the insults and the, the hatred that's heaped towards individuals who are on fire for Christ, who are, who are actually following God, um, the list is long. It's, it's funny. I'm noticing more and more 
of a climate shift towards Christians and individuals of faith, followers of Jesus. And, um, you know, yesterday I went to pick up my kids from the airport and I'm wearing my hat and in big, bold letters, it says, Jesus saves fam. And on my shirt, it says, hustle, pray and eat. You know, I'm a walking billboard for the gospel. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm living Jesus. You can see my light shining a mile away and just the smirks, you know, and, and I'm not, I'm not looking for them, but people are condescending, you know, they'll, they'll walk and you can tell that, you know, they might have a big old rainbow patch on their shirt. So you know where they stand and you pretty much know where, uh, their, their heart posture is towards people of faith because they've probably had poor experiences with well-meaning Christians. Uh, but you can see them kind of smirk or you can see them kind of, uh, and they do it noticeably, right? They, they want you to know that they're visibly agitated by you. They want you to know that they visibly, um, through their actions and their reaction, they want to project whatever is going on inside of them, their knee jerk reaction, because people of the world react react, people of the Lord respond. They want you to see their reaction, that they're, they're visibly trying to hold back vomit because you make them sick because of what you stand for, because you, you're, you're bigoted or you're filled with hatred because they want you to believe that, oh, love is love. And that, you know, you just do whatever makes you happy. You're not hurting anybody. They want you to believe these lies and not just people wearing rainbow flags, but you can see people's posture. You can, you can read it. And as I'm going to these places, you can see this shift and it's becoming more intense. It's becoming more uh, confrontational. Because now people uh, are, are wearing their beliefs on their clothes. I'm seeing masks still with rainbow colors. I'm seeing, and it's not just that. I'm seeing a lot more people wearing big old anarchist t-shirts with, uh, you know, the, the satanic star on them. I'm seeing people, uh, wearing just more and more stuff to let you know where they're at. And as a Christian, as somebody who's shining a light in a dark place, you're starting to see a lot more opposition, right? So they have not known him. It says, dear friends, now we are children of God and we have not yet been shown what we will be in the future, but we are going to be like Christ because we will see him as he really is. Verse three says, Christ is pure and all who have this hope in Christ keep themselves pure like Christ. It says in verse four, the person who sins breaks God's law. Yes, sin is living against God's law. Verse five says, you know that Christ came to take away sins and that there is no sin in Christ. So anyone who lives in Christ does not go on sinning. Anyone who goes on sinning has never really understood Christ and never known him. This is where there's a lot of issue, right? This is where there's a lot of secondary issue. And the secondary issue is this. There's an argument of once saved, always saved, right? Some people believe that salvation is a free gift that can never be taken away. And I believe that. I believe that your salvation is intact. It's not something that you have to work on and continue to like guard and make sure that you don't lose it. And here's why. Because if salvation, like, like how the, the, the audacity that we have to think that if your salvation can be lost, you haven't lost it right? If you believe salvation can be lost, then why haven't you lost yours? Because you've worked hard to keep it. Like really ask yourself that question. If it could be lost, are you doing enough to keep it? If it could be lost, that would scare the love out of me. That would scare me. I would be constantly making sure I, I would be walking around tiptoeing on eggshells, terrified because none of us are good enough to keep it intact. If it could be lost, you would have lost it. It's that simple. If you think that it can be lost and you haven't lost it, I would really take a long look in the mirror. If you think it can be lost, if you're like, yes, Andrew, it can be lost, then I want you to stop looking in the mirror and go, why haven't I lost it? Do I think that I'm good enough to keep it? Because if it could be lost, I'll tell you this, none of us are good enough to keep it intact. That is why Jesus came. Because none of us, it's almost like you don't, understand the point. If it could be lost, then you would have to work to keep it. And if you had to work to keep it, then you wouldn't need Jesus because you were good enough and you could work to stay safe. That's a pharisaical mindset. You're basically like, think about that. Oh, it can be lost. Then why haven't you lost yours? Oh, because you're good enough. Weird. Interesting. But what I do say 
and this is what I say is that those, so, so those who abuse the grace, let's just say you are saved, understand, right? Hey, somebody just said you would lose it the very next hour. You would lose it the very next minute. If it was to be lost, you would lose it the next minute. You would receive it and be like, oh, this is great. You'd set it down and then you'd be like, well, it's gone. Well, where'd I set it? It's like the remote, right? For, for, for mo like the remote, how you all, it just seems to like always be lost. You can't find it. You set it here, but now it's in a cushion or it's under the couch or it's in the refrigerator. You don't know where it's at. It's lost. You would lose that bad boy with the quickness. And if you think you're good enough to not lose it, woo, that's a bigger issue. I say this, people will say, well, Andrew, what about people who backslid? Okay. That's just it though, is once you receive salvation and you have a true relationship, right? You have true fellowship with God. You don't go on sinning. And it even says right here, look, anyone who goes on sinning has never really understood Christ and never knew him. So that's the thing. So those who are like, well, I was a Christian for 20 years and now I've fallen away. Okay. Did you say that you knew Christ or did you truly know him? Because individuals who truly know him don't walk away, right? They don't walk away. Does that make sense? So if you truly know him, you don't go on sinning. My question would be, my idea was like, I don't think you ever knew him. So it's not that you backslid. It's not that you walked away from faith. If you are saying, oh, well, I know Jesus, but you continue sinning, I'm going to go, I don't know if you really know him. I, I think that you might have an understanding of him. You might have read about him. You might have said in your mind, oh, I believe that. But you have not had an interaction with him. You have not met him. You don't have fellowship with him. Not to say that you can't have fellowship with Jesus and make mistakes. There is a stark difference. And we've talked about this in first John of a saint who might sin or a sinner who's trying and working to be a saint. Do you guys get that? My, my question would be like, I don't think if you truly know Jesus and what he's done for you and who he is and who you are, you would have to be crazy to walk away. Those who have experienced and sat in the presence of Jesus and had him tra change and transform their life and truly has fellowship and is walking with him, you would have to be a fool understanding what is at stake, your eternity, to let go of his hand and be like, you know what? You, you've, oh, you've saved me. You've changed me. You've transformed me. You, you, you know, oh, I'm good. I, don't get mad at me. This is, look, it says, verse six, read this on your own. Like, allow this to sink into your heart and into your mind. So anyone who lives in Christ does not go on sinning. They don't go on sin. You, if you're in Christ, you don't go on sinning. Anyone who goes on sinning has never really understood Christ and has never known him. That's the Bible saying it. If, if you're like, oh, well, I was a Christian. I, yeah, I know Jesus. I went to, hey, I went to church for 15 years. I've heard people say that. I went to church for 15 years. I served. I actually passed the plate around. I was a part of the worship team. But you know what? I walked away because of this, this, and that. And it's like, you went to church for 15 years. Awesome. You never met Jesus in those 15 years. You never knew him. You never actually knew him. You thought it was a title. You thought that you were saved by your attendance. You thought that you were saved by the fact that you served. You, you sat there for 15 years and you were in church. You read some of the book, but you never had true fellowship with Jesus. Because if you did, you wouldn't have left. Does this make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if you're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Read your scripture. That's in verse six. Anyway, it says, dear children in verse seven, do not let anyone lead you the wrong way. Christ is all that is right. Christ is all that is right. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. If you could lose your salvation, you would have lost it. Like, let's, like, I want you to remind yourself of that. If you could, you would have. It'd be gone for good. There's nothing that you could do to hold on to it, right? That's why grace is new daily. That we, it was done once and for all. When you come into true fellowship with him, that life, that's over. That's done, right? So to be like Christ, a person must do what is right. The devil has been sinning since the beginning. So anyone who continues to sin belongs to the devil. I want to be very clear though. 
There's no condemnation in Christ. I want to be very careful and I want to make sure that I explain this correctly. I'm saved. I have fellowship with Jesus. My salvation is intact. I'm not doing anything to keep it. Will I make a mistake and sin? Absolutely. I share that with you guys regularly. After that happens, what do I do? Do I go, oh my God, I might not even be saved, right? Uh, let me, let me just be transparent. I shared this a couple of weeks ago. I got into it at basketball with one of my own teammates and I had some choice words. The things that I said was a very poor witness for Jesus. It was horrible. Um, I let some words fly. I was extremely embarrassed. The Holy spirit in me immediately was convicted. I was like, it was like watching a wreck. It was bad. I, I felt like I was out of body. My spirit was sitting next to me and I was watching my flesh lay into somebody. And, and it was bad. It was bad. I, I wasn't, it wasn't a very proud moment. I had somebody's shirt in my hand. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that was the same week. I preached on Sunday and I had somebody's shirt in my hand on Monday. Guys, it was not good. Okay. That was a sin. When I was done, I didn't drive home going, oh my God, my salvation is not intact. I, uh, God's mad at me and he's angry at me. No, first and foremost, the Holy Spirit convicted me. I felt terrible, absolutely horrible. I apologized to the individual who I had just went up against. I also asked for forgiveness for those who had witnessed it. I prayed on my way home and I worshiped God and I, I repented. And when I got home, I told my wife, I'd let her know as well, right? Uh, I sat there in a little bit of like guilt and shame. I knew that that wasn't my best moment. But the next morning when I woke up, I woke up and said, that wasn't good. God, I need more of you. What I just learned is that there is a very real remnant of my flesh. And I did a poor job of regulating that. I did a poor job of staying in tune with you. I did a poor job of staying in alignment with you. God, I repent and I'm going to change action. Now, when I see myself getting to that point, I'm going to sub myself out of the game, right? If I see myself heading in that direction, I learned from it. I didn't sit there and shiver my timbers. I didn't think that I wasn't saved. I didn't question my salvation. I didn't question my relationship with God. I think it would be more of an issue if it didn't bother me. If I was just okay with like, okay, that he had it coming. I start making excuses, right? I start justifying my actions. That's when that's a bigger concern. Then it's like, do you really love people? Do you really have the love of Christ in you? Did, did that really affect you? Uh, do, are, are you being convicted by the Holy Spirit that dwells within you? If you get so comfortable with sin and falling out of alignment, that's where I would start to question. That's where it's like, wait a second. Do I even know Jesus? Do I really have a relationship? There's no conviction, right? There's no regret. There's no, there's no thought. There's no like, uh, there's no repentance. There's no change of action. There's no learning. So that will be my life until the day that I breathe my last breath. It's the process of sanctification. I am saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. I have relationship and fellowship with Christ. But every day I am going to be faced with tasks, obstacles. I'm going to have choices, decisions, and I, I'm going to have options because I still have free will. So I'm going to be faced with situations and how I react or I respond is up to me. But my salvation isn't hanging in the balance based on my choices between now and that day. It is done. God sees me as the perfection of Jesus. Jesus sits at the right hand of God interceding on my behalf. My sin is paid for. Even if tomorrow I fall into the same trap and make a mistake and do something that is less than honorable, there is grace, there is mercy, there is love, there is space and room for me to grow and to mature. There, there's that space of love because I am his child. So if my child wakes up and he chooses violence this morning, is that going to change my love for him? No, there will be discipline. There will be correction. There will be maybe a slap on the hand. There will be something there. There will be a learning experience, but my love hasn't changed. I might sit him down and go, look, man, that was dumb. You probably need to make better decisions because there's consequences for these decisions and choices that you're making. Here, take a little time out. Give me your phone. Right, And let's think about what you just did. Are you going to be able to do better? Yes, dad, I'm going to do better. I see that. Okay, what'd you learn? Okay, this is what I learned. Awesome. Here's your phone. You're off timeout. Get back to it. Go make me proud.
That's the relationship that we should be having with our heavenly father. My son's not going to sit here and be like, oh my God, you lost. Do you even love me anymore? Uh, are, 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 are you going to kick me out of the house? God, uh, dad, what, what? No, like that's, that's not the relationship. It started out. It says the father has loved us so much that we are called children of God. We are his children and he loves us. Verse nine says, those who are God's children do not continue sinning because the new life from God remains in them. It says that they are not able to go on sinning. I love that. It says that they are not able. I underlined it and highlighted it. They are not able. I am not able to continue to live that life without conviction and change, right? I'm not able. If I stumble and fall, there's the, the Holy Spirit that goes, uh-uh. It confirms, it goes, that's not it. That's not, you're, you're not able to do that anymore. Do you understand? I am in you. We don't do that. The way that you just acted, sir, that is not acceptable. We don't do that. You are not able to say that you are a child of God. You are not able to continue doing those things. So friends, listen, you are not able to go out and get drunk every week. And you are not able to continue to look at pornography. You are not able to continue to listen to the music of the world. You wonder why it's like fingernails scratching on the chalkboard. Do you understand why you're not able to continue doing the things that you were once able to do so easily? Before I was saved, I could smoke and drink and have sex and do whatever I wanted to do. And there was no conviction. I could live how I wanted to. Uh, before Christ, I was doing every drug under the sun. My, I was notching, stacking notches on my belt. I was doing whatever I wanted to do, whatever I wanted to do because I was able to, there was no conviction. I, there was no Holy spirit that dwelt inside of me. I did what I wanted because I was only in submission to the world and to myself. There was no answer and there was no Holy Spirit to say, ah, that's not right. Now, some of you might have consciences because of how you grew up and you have this moral standard of what's right and wrong. And you were like, well, I wasn't saved and I would never do those things. I didn't. I didn't have that moral compass because the way that I grew up was immoral. And so I was able to do these things freely without having any kind of consequence or ever any second thought. It says this though, the new life from God remains in you and you're not able to go on sinning. You can't, you're not able to. So although you might try the fact that you're just like, ah, that don't feel good. Oh, there's conviction. Ah, I don't like how that makes me feel. Guess what? That's evidence of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you. Pay attention to it, right? Many of us ignore that. And we start to numb that and we start to create an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit can't live. And then it's just like, did you really even know or have true fellowship with him? Verse 10 says, so we can see who's God's children and who the devil's children are. Those who do not do what is right are not God's children. And those who do not love their brothers and sisters are not God's children. It's evident by their works, by the way they live their life, by the way they continue sinning, by the way they have no conviction, by the way that they don't stop. You can see who is a child of God, meaning who has put their faith in Jesus and been adopted into the righteousness and the perfection of Jesus. And that's the beauty, though. All are called. All Everybody has the opportunity. So so everybody, every the people that you're looking at. They have the opportunity to repent from their sins, to start following God and to become a child, meaning becoming a brother or sister. So, so it's, it's, it's up to us. It's of the utmost importance that we're not prejudging, that we're not out here pre-qualifying individuals. You guys understand that? Oh, they look like they'd be a good fit for the church. Let's go share the gospel with them. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. It's not how it works. It's for everybody. Wait, what does my hat say? The gospel is for everyone, Jew, Gentile, sinner, saint, good, bad, black, white, yellow, brown, gay, straight, trans, right? You, you name it. The gospel is for everyone. I know some of y'all don't like that. Some of y'all don't like that because we want to prejudge, pre-qualify. We want to create a hierarchy of sins. Oh, well, they've done this, so they're up here. Their sin's worse than mine. Christian, Christian, Christian. Be wary of that kind of thought process and that kind of thinking. Thank you, God, that the gospel was for everyone. Because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't. It says this, we're going to jump down to 13. It says, brothers and sisters, do not be surprised when the people of the world hate you. Hey, newsflash, 
Um, we're living in a world that opposes Christianity. We live in a world that is against the name of Jesus. We, we live in a world where it is becoming more and more hostile of an environment for those who follow Christ. So many of us get our feelings hurt so quick, so quick when somebody says something bad about Jesus. Yo, it's only going to get worse. I, pl I pray that you guys understand that. If you are waiting for this world to go back to normal, you're going to be waiting a long time because it is not coming back. Normal is not coming back. You guys, Jesus is. Uh, understand that we are we are heading in a direction a and from start to finish we are closer to the finish than we are to the start please understand that we are nearing the end and please don't let anybody fool you and tell you when it is because nobody knows it could be in a week it could be in 10 years it could be in the year 3000 nobody knows but i'm going to live this life that i have every breath that i breathe with a sense of urgency knowing that there is a, a lot on a, a lot at stake there's a lot on uh, on the line right now and we are pieces of a chess game a, a, a game that's been won but 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 nonetheless a part of a puzzle that's so much and far greater than we could even think of or imagine we were bought for a price. And what God saved us for was not to sit on our hands and to sit in our lazy boys and watch other people in the pulpit. He has called you to a place of ministry. And that doesn't mean preaching or pastoring. Ministry is the art of serving, using the gifts, using the, the, the talents, using the resources, the time, the energy, the effort that he has given you for his glory to make him more known, essentially. That's what you've been saved for. And so this is what I'm encouraging you as you start to walk out the purpose and the plan that God has for you. Once you remove the blinders, when your eyes are open, you start to understand what this life is about, why God saved you, the purpose, the place, all of these things start to come together. The temperature from the world hating you will increase. And please do not be, please do not be surprised. It, it says, hey, brothers and sisters, don't be surprised when the people of the world hate you. Like, stop acting so surprised. Stop acting so brand new. But some of us are just like, I would never. And it's like, well, get used to it there, homie, because it's about to get hotter. And here's the thing. The more the enemy ain't messing with you. If you're like, well, I'm not under spiritual attack. You might want to see what you're doing with your life. Like, I'm not saying that spiritual attack is the greatest indicator of you walking in purpose. But I'll tell you this much that I know from personal experience. When you're so far away from the purpose, the plan, and the will that God has for your life, the enemy has you where he wants you. He's going he's gonna to be like, oh, everybody back off. Chill, chill, chill. He's doing it to himself. Hey, hey listen, don't attack him. Don't start to awaken the Holy Spirit in them. They're so far away from God and where God wants them. Let's just keep them there. It's when you start to get closer to the plan, the purpose, the will, the reason that you were made. That's when the temperature gets turned up because the devil doesn't want you operating at full capacity. Right? When, you, when you're fully plugged into God, your battery's at 100%. Oh, look out. Because now you start walking with boldness and authority. You start knowing who you are. You start casting out demons, man. You start laying hands. The things that you're saying are bold. No weapon formed against you will prosper. The storms of this life, they no longer scare you. You're just like, ah, that's just another trial. That's just another obstacle. But guess what? I'm anchored to Christ. He's my firm foundation. I ain't going nowhere because I know who I serve. And I know what this life is about. When you start living like that, that's when the gates of hell start sending out armies to try to distract you. To try to pull your focus and your attention away from what you're doing. Right? Pay attention. People acting surprised when the world hates you. Come on. I don't know what's going on, but I'm seeing so I seen somebody. Wait, what about? I'm gonna just I'm gonna just keep it to the scripture. I can't even do that with the comments with you guys today. I can't even today. I don't know what's going on, y'all. Crazy. Verse 16 says this. Uh, this is how we know what real love is. Jesus gave his life for us, so we should give our lives for our brothers and sisters. Um, there is a cost that was paid for us. This is, we, we know love because Jesus laid his life down. He gave his life for us. And the way that we... Um, Show love is by giving up our lives. Now you can look at this physically or, um, you know, like, like, like literally, 
or, you know, we can look at it figuratively. I don't think that it's necessarily saying that you got to jump in front of a bullet for your brother or sister. But think about this. If there's people out there who are lost, right? There's people out there who are lost, but they're a part of the flock, brothers and sisters. There's brothers and sisters in Christ who are out there. They're still asleep. They're still blind. They haven't heard the gospel. They might be living in sin. The Holy Spirit hasn't taken it hasn't taken root in their heart. Understand this. Please understand this. If we have brothers and sisters who are lost, we're the 99 right now. There's 470 of us. Let's just say we're all awake and we know what the purpose is. And we've got brothers. We've got the one that's out there that might be lost, that might be blind, that might still be living in sin, that hasn't been awakened to truth and living fully in the plan, purpose, and will that God has for us. What I believe it's saying is, hey, you got to let go of your life. Jesus let go of his life. You got to let go of yours to go get your brothers and sisters. If you love people, you're going to lay your life down. What I think, this is not even scriptural. This is what was spoke to me this morning. It's not jumping in front of a bullet that we're talking about losing your life for your brother and sister. It's saying, look, I have visions, dreams, and goals. I want to be a rock star. I want to be sold out to this. Like I have these visions and dreams and goals that the world told me is going to make me happy and fulfill me, right? I have this dream of working, retiring, traveling in the world, right? My dream and vision, what I want my life to be about is this, but God says different. It's laying down that life that you thought you wanted for the life that God made you for. And that's where I think that a lot of people are. They're in this place where they're, they love God and they love people. Uh, they're just trying to figure out what it is that God wants them to do. And, and part of that is laying down your life, the life that you thought that you needed or thought that you wanted and say, okay, um, this is what God's calling me to. It's not as sexy. There's not as many benefits. It's not as cool. Um, you know, the hours aren't great. The benefits are low. There's not a lot of gratitude back, like, but it's ministry. And, and I love the, those who are lost, my brothers and sisters who are lost. I love them so much that I'm willing to lay down what I thought I wanted for what God called me to. I read a story yesterday, an Indianapolis, Indianapolis Colts player. He was a third year player. Um, he, was going to be a returning starter at the, I think a defensive back position. He was drafted three years ago. This was his year. He was either going to get a signing bonus or redo his rookie contract. I think he made 850, maybe $950,000 each year as a part of his signing bonus. He retired from football. I think Wednesday he announced his retirement and then he's going into ministry. I don't know if you guys heard about that. He, he said, I've got a lucrative career. He's healthy. He was stepping into a starting position. It's his third year in the league. He's starting to make a name for himself. He walked away from a multi-million dollar contract to become a minister, to become a minister. Um, that's what I'm talking about. This man had a decision to make. He said, I can be in the NFL and I can continue to make gobs and gobs of money with endorsements and fame and clout and influence. And, you know, I've, I've, I've basically got my life set. But he said, you know what? I'm going to answer the call of me. There was a call that was louder than the football field. And he's willing to lay that down and walk away from all of that for his calling. How many of you guys would do that? Right? How many of you guys would do that? That's a big decision. But to have the clarity, right? A lot of you guys will look, how would I know? Well, what if I, what is God's call? Look, it says that his sheep know his voice. I think that many of you hear the call. I think that a lot of you uh, are, 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 you do hear it. I just think a lot of you don't want to hear it. I think a lot of you know deep in your spirit. I believe that if you, the Holy Spirit dwells within you, there is confirmation. You've been told. Things have been spoken. There has been prophecy. There have been dreams. I believe that God isn't just like, well, we ain't going to let him know what he's made for. All right? God is not a God of confusion. The only thing that's confused is you. You hear the call. You know what God wants to do, but you're scared because, uh, because uh, maybe you lack faith. Uh, you don't know how things are going to turn out. But, but many of us, we know what it is. I can sit here and tell you, I was called at 23. I didn't answer the call for almost 12 years. So I, I would be a liar if I sat here and be like, well, I didn't know what God wanted me to do. No, bro, I didn't want to do what God wanted me to do. A lot of you guys are like Jonah. Jonah was called to Nineveh. J Jonah was told what he needed to go do. He didn't want to do it. And so he ran. He went the opposite direction. 
And then we understand how that happened. He ended up in the belly of a well for a few days. Many of you are in the belly of the well. Many of you know what God has called you to do. Your spirit is telling you right now. The spirit inside of you is confirming it. The Holy Spirit that dwells within you is screaming and saying, oh, you know what I told you you're supposed to be doing. You know right now. All right, you're turning this off. You're cutting it off because you're like, Ugh, I don't like that. You know exactly what you're supposed to be doing and where you're supposed to be at, but you're not because you're scared, you lack faith, or you just don't want to do it. It's not what you want to do. I think that there are a lot of people in there, but the scripture says, hey, look, and this is what I think that it's talking about. It says that Jesus gave his life for us. He gave his life. Yo, he was God in the flesh. He could have been anything. He could have done anything. Imagine the power and, and, and the ability that he had. He could have been the best carpenter in the world, right? If that's what he wanted to do, he could have been the best fisherman in the world. He could have gotten fame and clout and influence. He could have went on a world tour. He could have, he just would have like, hey, watch this. Yo, he could have been the best liquor maker, right? He's out here turning oceans into wine. He could have done whatever he wanted to. He said, no, 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 I'm here for a purpose. There's a plan and there's a will. It's not easy. It's not sexy. It's not comfortable. It's going to be challenging. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be backstabbed. I'm going to experience all of these things, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to lay down my life because I love them. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot of souls at stake. I'm going to lay my life down. I'm going to choose not to do the thing that I could do, but I'm going to do what I was made to do. And so we did it. So it says, look, if Jesus gave his life for us, so we should give our lives for our brothers and sisters. There are brothers and sisters out there lost and God wants to use us to reach them. But he's, it's gonna be really hard for us to reach them when our God and the thing that we've exalted in our life is the things of this world. Sheesh. This might be too, this might be too much meat and potato. It's Friday, you guys are full. I don't, we've, been fe we've been feeding you all week, Right? I'm going to, I'm going to just pump my brakes right about there. No, I'm not. I lied. Verse 21, my dear friends, if our hearts do not make us feel guilty, we can come without fear into God's presence. Stop being fearful of God. Next verse. And God gives us what we ask for because we obey God's commands and do what pleases him. I had to do this one. I had to do this one because so many people are like, well, God's not answering my prayer, right? God's not giving me what I want. God gives us what we ask for because we obey God's commands and do what pleases him. Look, the closer you get to God, the more your life is going to be uh, a mirror of what it is that he wants you to be. So understand, the longer I walk with God, the things that I ask for change. I'm no longer asking for things that benefit me because I've obeyed God's commands, because I've laid my life down, because I'm no longer trying to live just for me. The things that I've asked for have changed. I'm no longer asking just for to win the lottery. I'm no longer just asking for uh, people in my life to change or my situation to change. I'm asking God to change me. And guess what? He has given me what I ask. I'm asking for wisdom and knowledge, discernment. I'm asking for understanding. I'm asking for uh, things in the spiritual realm like territory. I'm saying, God, let's allow me to be a plant in this city. God, I want you to make, I, I, wanna, I want Inglewood to be my city. I want to be, I want this to be my territory. God, give that to me. Help me to steward this area. And guess what? He's doing that. Right? The things that I've asked for change because me stewarding an area and receiving territory, it's not about me. It's not about my name. It's about Jesus. And it's about loving my brothers and sisters. Do you think I wanted to be a pastor growing up? That when people were like, Andrew, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I want to pastor a church. I want to sit in my Jeep for 230 some odd days and do a Bible study every day. I never wanted to do this. I, I had dreams of playing ball. I had dreams of going overseas and playing professionally. I had dreams of making it big. That's what I wanted to do. And, and to be honest, I think I could have done it. In fact, I know I could have done it. But I had to lay my life down, my dreams, my visions, my goals, in order to do what God called me to do. Because there's lost. There's my brothers and sisters are out there are lost. There's people out there hurting. There's people out there who need Jesus. And it is my privilege to be able to share. And it's an honor to be able to go out and share the gospel with those people. And, and by the grace of God, be a part of something greater than me. And by the grace of God, I am allowed to be a part of individuals getting saved. It's so fun. It is so, like, it is, 
you sleep real good knowing that what you're doing, look, you sleep with under attack, sleep paralysis, the demons come in, they try to get you there. The, the gates of hell are, are, are rattling and there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of that that goes on. There's a lot of attacks. Um, but I know how the story ends. I know who won. I know who was victorious. So I'm not up like, oh my gosh, the attacks are crazy because I'm walking in the plan, purpose, and will of what God called me to do. It's like, ah, it's part of the game. Hey, I'm not surprised when people hate me. I'm not surprised when there's attacks. I'm not, I'm not surprised when there's resistance. I'm not surprised. Like, I, I'm kind of indifferent to it at this point. It's like, ah, here we go. Another financial issue. Oh, here comes another unexpected bill. Oh, somebody's got sick. Oh, somebody's on their deathbed. Oh, there's an attack. They're like, there's all of these things pulling at my attention, trying to distract me. Wow, I see this. This is all of these things here in the physical realm. But at the end of the day, I know how this ends. If I breathe my last breath, I know where I'm going. That's where I'm going to leave off. First John. You guys are reading this on your own. Again, this is your devotion. This is your time. I'm not reading it all to you. I almost did today because it was fire. But we started out talking about dreams. I shared with you guys my dream. Nothing done in haste. Uh, I, I read it, wrote it down. Nothing done in haste uh, lasts. Something like that. I said something that was fire. I got it written down. It's in my notes. I See, that's why I got to wake up out of these dreams and write stuff down. Because if I don't, I, I'll forget my breakfast. I will. I forgot by the end of this live, right? It's crazy. All I know is, hey, nothing done quickly is, is going to last uh, for eternity. No, no, nothing done. Nothing done in haste. So slow down. God's doing things. But we talked about dreams, right? Here we see, I'm going to do a quick synopsis, a quick, uh, a quick one just to get, stands the test of time. Thank you. Somebody wrote it down. I appreciate that. Somebody's paying attention. It wasn't me. Um, see, I couldn't do good in school. I struggled. I couldn't pay attention for more than five minutes. I was bored and exhausted and my memory was horrible. Bad memory. Bad memory. So Joseph, he just got locked up. Potiphar's wife was pushing up on him. She grabbed him by the loins, grabbed him by his garments, uh, made some false accusations. Obviously, Potiphar was upset uh, because he thought that this young, strapping, handsome, uh, light-skinned Hebrew boy was pushing up on his old lady. So he has him locked up. While he's locked up, he has received favor. Everywhere he goes, everything he puts his hands to, he, he receives favor. So what we see is here, Joseph's in prison, and um, two of the pharaohs, guys, the butler and the baker, they find themselves incarcerated and he, they're under Joseph's care. So he's serving them and he's taking care of them while they're locked up. And, uh, they both wake up after having a dream and they look sad. And so Joseph's like, why, you know, what's going on? Why are you sad? And they're like, well, we had a dream, but no interpreter. And he's like, well, isn't the interpretation from God? It's God's interpretation. You know, tell me the dream and I'll, I'll interpret it for you. And so the butler is just like, he has a wild dream about, um, you know, seeing vines and branches and buds and blossoms and it comes together and he sees Pharaoh's cup in his hand and he takes the grapes and pressed them into the cup and, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph, Joseph was like, okay, look, in three days, you're about to get out of here and you're going to be restored to the proper place in the place that you were in. Hey, but when this happens, don't forget your boy, right? I just gave you good news. And then the baker's like, hey, do mine, do mine. Like, what's mine? Let me tell you my dream. I had a dream too. Interpret mine. And so he talks about some birds and some baskets and things on his head. And Joseph was like, look, man, I got some bad news for you. He's like, within three days, Pharaoh's going to lift you off your head and he's going to hang you on a tree and the birds are going to eat your flesh. And he's just like, what? That's a horrible interpretation. I would have just rather not known because imagine the next three days, all right? Imagine being the baker and the butler gets sprung on the third day. And you're just like, wait a second, that's not, this is coming true. I'm about to be hung and the birds are about to eat my flesh. Like that's one of the dreams you're kind of like, eh, I would have rather not known. But it comes to pass on the third day, it was Pharaoh's birthday and he springs him from the clink. Boom, it reestablishes the butler to his position, the baker, he's done for. And then it says, the chief butler, I like that in verse 23, the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him, right? Forgot him. He said, hey, I'm going to give you this dream. Don't forget about your boy. And he's like, man, I got you, bro. Uh, when I, uh, I start, we started from the bottom. Now we're here. As soon as I get up there, bro, I'm calling you up. I'm going to remember where I'm from. I'm going to bring you with me. 
And I can just see him, butlers popping bottles. Ah, Joseph, who? Like, he forgot about him. We will see that that will um, eventually be changed. But for the moment, you know, poor Joseph, he's still in the clink, man. He's still locked up while the butler's uh, popping bottles and celebrating the birthday and the baker's hanging from his neck. Um, I love the Old Testament. It's amazing. Good stories. The way that I read it is literally like a, uh, it's like a movie, but um, I'm really enjoying it. And we will see, there's a great message that we'll get a little bit deeper into when it comes to the story of Joseph. But one of the underlying things is just the, when you become a leader, many leaders and more effective leaders go through a certain amount of suffering, go through a certain amount of troubles, issues, and uh, just obstacles in general. And what happens is a lot of, I mean, everybody goes through stuff. But how you respond to the stuff determines the kind of leader that you will be. If you take the position of being a victim rather than a victor, uh, you're not going to be a very effective leader because what you're going to do is you're going to lack accountability. You're going to constantly blame shift. You're going to make excuses. You're going to have this poor me mentality like, oh, poor me. Joseph could have been like, oh, my brother sold me into, I was dad's favorite and they sold me into slavery and now I was falsely accused. And now I'm sitting in prison and they forgot about me. Even after I helped him, he could have taken this position of constantly complaining, constantly making excuses, constantly, uh, you know, shifting the blame and pointing fingers. But Joseph had God with him. And rather than becoming a victim, he became a victor. He allowed his circumstances, his pit moments, his prison moments, he allowed them to shape him. Even being betrayed by his brothers, even being lied on, he allowed love to lead his life. He still loved people. He still was kind. He still was caring. And God was with him. And because he kept that attitude and position of praise, as because he kept this mindset of being a victor, God blessed the work of his hands. And he was able to to come out and we will see him develop into this very effective leader who is still very empathetic and loving, who had at a moment, uh, he, he had a moment to be able to return all of the evil and all of the wickedness that was done to him because he got to that position of power, but he let sympathy, empathy, love, and truth reign. So many times we allow the things that we go through to harden us. Right? When we allow those things to harden us and, and to change us and affect us for the negative, God can't really do much with that. Don't allow your circumstances and situations to harden your heart and to affect you in a negative manner. Don't take on that victim mentality. Look at the things, the obstacles that you've gone through as opportunities. How can you grow? How can you learn? I'm not saying that it's been easy or comfortable or it hasn't been riddled with grief or shame or hurt or scars or trauma because a lot of the stuff we've gone through, I'm sorry to say, comes with a lot of baggage. But if you can find the strength through Christ to allow yourself to heal unpack that baggage, what you'll start to see is that baggage is actually some really nice clothes that you can put on and will give you a breadth of experience that you can now pull from in order to empathize with individuals and you can make an impact in this world. Woo. You might have to watch the replay and run that part back because I basically said that the things that you go through, you can use them to help other people. You can use the trauma, you can use the hurt, you can use the abuse, you can use those experiences to now relate to other individuals who have gone through that same thing. And when you are now on the same level as these people because of your experiences, you have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. That's a word. Let's pray. Let's get out of here. I got a lot of stuff to do. I love you guys. I honor you. And um, I just pray that you guys know how much I do care about you, that uh, I, I, I love getting up every day at 4.30, um, sometimes 4 when God wants to give me these random and ridiculous dreams, but I really do enjoy getting up and spending these mornings with you. Um, it fills me. It feeds me. I leave this feeling light, filled with love, purpose. If this is all I did today, um, I think that I'm walking in the purpose that God made me for. If, if ministering 237 days or however many days in a row and preaching a sermon every single day for the last 230 something, if that's what God made me for and you guys get a little bit of value from it, then I'm living a complete life. So thank you guys. Thank you guys for being a part of it. 
And thank you guys for believing in me, with me, trusting the badges, the subscriptions, the donations, all of that stuff matters. I appreciate you. I love you. And then most importantly, believing and praying for a building and for that million dollar miracle, those six figure checks that are going to be coming my way. Uh, and again, it's not for me to buy belts and cars and stupid stuff. It's for me to make an impact in this world. And I'm believing that that's what God's saying. There's going to be donors. There's going to be beneficiaries. I think I said that wrong. There's going to be uh, philanthropists and individuals who see the vision and trust where we're going. And they're going to want to finance that. And it's going to help put us in a better place so we can establish more territory in this city. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your truth. We want to thank you for your love, your mercy, and grace. Um, we are honored to be in this place. We are honored to be here and to hear your truth. God, that's what we need. In a world filled with darkness and evil, a world filled with lies, we, we need your truth. You are the true bricklayer. You are the true foundation. You are the anchor to our hearts and souls, Lord. We need you, and we cannot do this without you. So God, as we leave this place, our prayer, our one prayer is that your will would be done. That's what we truly want. And we want to be so in alignment, in alignment with you that whatever your will is, that's what we want. God, that's what we want. We don't want it if it's not from you. We don't want any doors opened. We don't want anything if it's not from you. So close doors, close opportunities, lead us, guide us, love us, and help us to be more like Jesus. And we pray this in his mighty name. Amen and amen. I love you guys, and I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your day, and we'll see you guys later.